Scientists often express the idea that there either is or needs to be a bright line between science and policy. If you do cross that line into the public sphere, you will lose credibility. That they should, quote, let the facts speak for themselves. Climate scientist Jim Hansen has coined the phrase or used the word reticence to describe this position. The idea that scientists are reluctant to speak up about what they know about climate change and the threat that it represents and that they want to let the facts speak for themselves. Scientists in many fields, perhaps most fields, face the sentinel problem. It is what I call the first existential crisis of modern science, obviously and specifically the crisis of nuclear weaponry. Beginning in 1945 and throughout the 40s, 50s, and into the early 60s, many leading physicists felt they had a moral obligation to speak out against the proliferation of nuclear weapons. These men had played an essential role in creating weapons that now threatened human safety and possibly even human survival. And therefore, they believed that they had an obligation to raise an alarm, to be sentinels, and even to suggest means to control this threat. Drawing on the intellectual framework of scientific rationality, they argued that it was rational to be alarmed and irrational to be complacent. Also, of course, Albert Einstein, who after the war became a vocal advocate for international control of nuclear weaponry and for the growth and importance of international diplomacy to control nuclear weapons. Why did they do this? And why did they think that it was appropriate to cross a line that many of us today think wouldn't be appropriate to cross? Well, the argument they made is one that I've labeled epistemic proximity. It was not just that they had been involved in building the weapons, although that was an important part of their argument, but they also argued that as physicists, they had a uniquely vivid appreciation and understanding of the damage that nuclear weapons could wreak, that they could explain things that other people really didn't and maybe even couldn't understand about what an arms race would mean and therefore why arms control was so essential. I know of no evidence that the theory of relativity or the photoelectric effect or any of Einstein's scientific work lost credibility because he was an advocate of nuclear arms control. The fear of losing credibility I want to suggest tonight is exactly that. It's a fear. And I think that as scientists, we should be basing our choices on evidence, not fear. So the third part, then, of my argument. We need to speak for facts because facts do not speak for themselves. And they don't for at least two reasons, and I'm sure you can think of many more, but two I want to focus on here tonight. The one I think is fairly obvious. We live in a world where many people are trying to silence facts. And the arguments that these people are making are not just about the facts. In fact, they're mostly not about the facts at all. They're about the implications of those facts, the implications for their political beliefs and for values. And in my opinion, you cannot answer a question about values by letting facts speak for themselves. The take home message is that climate change denial is not about the facts. It's not about inadequacies in the science or insufficiencies in climate models. That's not what drives it. If that were what was driving it, we wouldn't see a lot of things that we do see, including what for me is one of the most telling graphics that I have, this extreme correlation of climate change denial with political affiliation. We have seen for many years now an overwhelming difference in how Democrats and Republicans think about climate change, with the vast majority of Democrats, 80 to 90 percent, accepting that climate change is occurring, accepting that it's mostly caused by human activities, accepting that it's underway, accepting that there's a scientific consensus about it, but about half of all Republicans rejecting those views. What we see is that the key ideology that informs most of climate change denial is belief in laissez-faire economics and the magic of the marketplace. The belief in the capacities of the market to solve problems efficiently, and contrarily, or with that, skepticism about the capacity of the government to solve problems efficiently or even at all. And I think this explains a lot of the Democratic-Republican divide, because in general, to a first approximation, Republicans tend to be more skeptical about government than Democrats. 
And with that then goes a kind of fear, fear that the anticipated harms of climate change, like the harms of smoking, will be used to justify the extension of government reach into the marketplace and into our lives. And this, I think, helps to explain why climate change denial is so much more prevalent in the United States than anywhere else in the world. Because we have in the United States a deeply rooted belief that the government who governs best governs least. Whatever the issue is, whether it's tobacco or ozone depletion or acid rain or pesticide regulation, the claim is always the same. If we do not carefully delineate the government's role in regulating dangers, there is essentially no limit to how much government can ultimately control our lives. So this is the key argument that we find repeated over and over and over again. If we regulate X, whatever X is, then soon the government will also regulate Y and Z, and we will lose our freedom. First, we'll lose our economic freedom, and then we will lose our political and personal freedom. So this is the common thread in all these different issues, which otherwise might seem unrelated. That scientists doing science, in other words, us, we, all of us, we inadvertently discover a serious problem. And the solution to this problem, like tobacco or ozone depletion, requires some sort of government action. And so people who don't want that government action, either because of economic self-interest or because of authentically held political views, reject the science and in some cases attack the scientists. So this raises a crucial point that I think it's extremely important for all of us to understand. Whatever we think of the merits of the arguments about laissez-faire capitalism, whatever we think about the merits of the arguments of trying to solve problems in the private sector, when scientists have been attacked, it has not been because they crossed the line into policy. It was because their scientific research had revealed or affirmed or explained a serious problem, like the millions of deaths from tobacco use, or the threat to life on Earth from stratospheric ozone depletion, serious problems that could not be solved by the private sector alone. So the crucial point here is that the causal arrow is actually the reverse of what is often assumed or even alleged. Scientists have not been attacked because they spoke out in public. Rather, they have become public figures because they were attacked. So if you do important scientific work, not speaking in public will not necessarily protect you from attack. So my point here then is that science has not been politicized because we somehow crossed the line. Science has been politicized as an instrument to undermine it by groups and individuals who do not like what they see as the political implications, the social implications of our findings. And this includes, but is not limited to, industries that make the products that cause these problems. So this is why facts don't speak for themselves, because these arguments are not about scientific facts, and because they're not about the facts, we can't refute them with, fact, with facts. I think we have to address the values and the implicit assumptions behind them. We have to address the premises, that the facts line up with some very good fundamental values that we share with all of our fellow American citizens from Michigan to Idaho, from Utah to Maine, from Florida to Alaska. The value of fairness, which includes protecting innocent people from getting hurt. The value of accountability, that those who make a problem, who made a problem, have an obligation to address it. The value of realism, accepting the reality that sometimes markets do fail, and sometimes there are problems that we have to address when the market doesn't work efficiently, or doesn't work at all. And the values of creativity, and technological leadership, and hard work of rolling up our sleeves and getting the job done. Since when haven't Americans believed in the capacity, in our capacity to fix problems? Right? There are values that the market doesn't protect, like the basic inherent dignity of all people and all creation. And this is the argument that Pope Francis made so beautifully. And if you haven't read the Papal Encyclical, I beg you to read this book, because it is such a beautiful articulation of fundamental, crucial values that so many of us share with our fellow Americans and with people all around the globe. And it's a very, very powerful argument against the denial of climate change and in favor of our power to address this issue 
and to make the world a better place, to make the world what it should be. Because, and finally, I want to make the point, because although climate change deniers always invoke freedom, this is the mantra you hear, freedom, 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 but in the long run, climate change deniers are not protecting our freedom. They're actually threatening it. 